So welcome to episode 16, The Rise of Christianity through the Gospel of Matthew, which we will also be talking about tomorrow. So we're making a big change from the world of classical antiquity to the world of what we call the Judeo-Christian tradition. As I think you'll have seen from the reading tonight, there's a lot that's building on Jewish tradition in the story of Jesus. And really, the thing that kind of jumped out at me as I was reading this is what a different world we're in right away from the very first pages of the Matthew Gospel. Where it's almost like we've gone back to the world of Homer or, or to the world of the Old Testament and the world of Moses, in which there are prophets and miracles dreams, mysticism, supernaturalism, and basically a, a very different world outlook than, than what we've been seeing with the rational Greeks and the Romans who were proceeding in a more philosophical way. So I want to get your impressions of this reading, just the first, I want you to shout out some words that come into your mind when you think about the reading that you did for today. Faith, friendship, Virtue and righteousness are all things that, that, that you guys mentioned as standing out in this reading. I'd like to focus tonight primarily, or at least I'd like to make sure that we cover totally what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And this is really the core um, compressed version of Christian teaching or of Jesus's teaching. So we're going to focus on the Sermon on the Mount, make sure we really nail that. But along the way, we're going to pick up some of the greatest quotes and some of the common expressions which um, come to us from the Bible as a work of literature. And I would just say, in a certain way, speaking for myself, when I approach the Bible, the Christian Bible, as when I approach the Hebrew Bible, I don't approach it in exactly the same way as reading philosophy or literature from the classical world. Maybe I should, but perhaps out of respect, an understanding that perhaps half the people in the world believe that this is the word of God, I approach it a little more respectfully and cautiously. And I'm happy to say where I don't understand or don't agree with it. But even though I maybe should treat it like regular literature, I, I still treat it a little differently, I think just out of respect and maybe decorum or good taste. So I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but that certainly doesn't stop me from being critical and analytical and trying to pull all the meaning out of it that I can. We begin with this really interesting birth narrative, which is kind of adventurous. And one of the things that jumped out about it to me is the role that dreams play. I can't recall in anything that we read up to now where dreams are so important. I really can't, I'm, I'm, I'm racking my brain, but I believe within the first two pages, there's five or six dreams in which information is being communicated to people from God, apparently, or from heaven, from the other world, through dreams. There's also this notion of angels operating, which we find in the Old Testament, but you have to go all the way back to Homer to find, who was it, Hermes, basically acting as an angel or messenger of Zeus, and maybe Iris, the rainbow messenger as well. But we're, we're thrown back into a much more archaic or primal in some ways, a more primitive and perhaps less civilized world. Let's talk about this Sermon on the Mount. It's very, very famous. It begins with these eight blessings. One of the most famous is, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we begin to see here right away that even though we're in the world of Homer in a certain way, the values are very different than in the world, say, of the Iliad. You wouldn't, I think, find in the Iliad anywhere a hero like Achilles or Hector valorizing or celebrating meekness. But here we have the meek shall inherit the earth. So what this Bible is saying is that there's a different type of heroism. Being meek and not fighting and being pacifist and peaceful, which is a theme we started seeing in the Stoic philosophers, is the new model of heroism. This is certainly not a warlike philosophy, even though Christians 
would go on for the next 2,000 years to make a lot of wars. I point out to you the section subtitled City on a Hill, and I will just read a bit from it. I call you the light of the world. No one can hide a city set on a hill, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket, but they set it on a stand and it gives light to all the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Well, first of all, it reminds me of Marcus Aurelius' statement um, that man should live as if on a mountaintop. But the idea of a city on a hill became a kind of guiding idea for the original pilgrims who settled New England in Massachusetts. They wanted their colony, their new colony, their Massachusetts colony, to be what they called a city on a hill. So in other words, they saw it as fulfilling Christ's command to give an example to the nations, an example of virtue, an example of uh, purity, righteousness for the whole world to see. So that becomes very important to the whole American idea. And even people who are not Christians in America still see America as a guiding light to the world. Abraham Lincoln, who was a Christian, called the United States the last best hope of man on earth. So this idea of a city on the hill, and specifically of the United States as a city on a hill, comes from the Matthew Gospel. The idea of not hiding your light under a bushel basket is something I have often thought about in my own life. Whenever I think about should I publish something or should I set it aside because it's too controversial. And, and basically what Jesus is saying is if you have a talent or if you have a skill, or if you have an excellence, don't hide it, but let that flame burn for the world to see, because otherwise it won't do your fellow humans any good. Now let's move on to something which I would call a concern with purity. And we started seeing this with Socrates, who said, you know, make yourself have a beautiful soul. And then we started seeing it with the Stoics like Seneca too, where they became more concerned with making their souls perfect and calm and less concerned with the outside world. Now with Jesus, he takes us farther and he basically accuses the rabbis of not being pure enough. And this is a Christian move which will occur over and over and over again. So that when we get to about the year 1500, the Protestants do this to the Catholics. They say, you Catholics, you, you people who or in with the Pope and Rome and the priests, you're not pure enough. We're going to break away and make a more pure church. And then the Protestant churches kept breaking away from each other. And the United States was settled by all these fragmenting factions of Christian churches, none of whom thought that any of them were pure enough. For unless you make yourselves more righteous than your rabbis, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So... This is beginning to be the idea, which was mentioned in the introduction to this text, of making yourself as good as God. The perfectibility of the individual soul is now taking on a kind of life of its own. Under concerning adultery, every man who looks at a woman lustfully has already sinned in his heart. So again, this idea of purity, and he takes it so far that he says, if your right eye or your right hand causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. He's not meaning literally, but he's saying you either have to make it pure or get rid of it. So we've all heard the expression, the Puritans, right? The pilgrims were the Puritans. That is coming from this text. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him your left cheek to strike too. This idea of meekness, again, we saw some of that in Seneca. Love for your enemies. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If you love only those who love you, what special reward do you gain? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you respect only your brethren, you do no more than the Gentiles do. As God's chosen people, you must make yourselves as perfect as your heavenly Father. So the idea of chosenness and Jewishness, Jesus is now doubling down on that. And he's saying, if you are chosen, act like you're chosen. Actually be chosen and choose to be as perfect as your heavenly father. Again, that Puritan idea, making yourself pure. He's raising the bar. 
He's asking people to do more and to be better on the inside and not just do stuff for outward show. So we get into the next section, which I would call against virtue signaling. Today we call virtue signaling where people kind of fall all over themselves to prove how virtuous they are, right? So there's a lot of like corporate advertising, which puts a lot of this stuff in, and people have called it virtue signaling. Jesus sets himself roundly against that. He says, beware of practicing your piety in public where people will see you. When you give money to the poor, sound no trumpet. Do not let the left hand know what the right hand does, but keep your sacrifices secret. Your father who sees all will reward you. So again, against this idea of displaying your holiness, he wants you on the one hand to let your talents be displayed and not, he doesn't want you to hide your merits under a bushel basket, but he also doesn't want you kind of showing off how holy you are, how many prayers you say, how much money you give to the temple. He doesn't like that because he thinks that's really fake. No man can serve two masters is a very famous thing. But let's go to this Stoic idea of, as Jesus puts it, where you store your treasure, there also will you store your heart. I believe it was yesterday or the day before, and I believe it was in Seneca, that we saw almost exactly that same idea. And then we talked about how it was going to come up in Jesus, and here it is. So the idea is that you store up material treasures, you know, you can't take that with you to heaven. And basically, your soul is bound to go to heaven and be with God. And if you put your attentions on things like gold and clothes and material things, which you can't take with you to heaven, they're going to distract you from the things you need to do to get to heaven, like treat the poor charitably and, you know, love your neighbor and all that kind of stuff. And if you get bound up in rivalry over gold or race for riches, it's going to lead you down a bad path or a difficult path. Another way of saying that, I've heard people say, what you own, owns you. So you think that you possess your possessions, but actually your possessions possess you. But really, we start to see an anti-wealth, an anti-money, an anti-materialist attitude, and really kind of a cult of poverty, which we saw in Diogenes, I think, where the idea is, try not to own anything and try not to be too concerned with money and the things of this world, because it will take you off the path of making yourself good on the inside. Another theme I would like to point out under the heading, don't worry. Now, this is something which seems to go against the idea we've seen in the Western tradition of planning for the future, forethought, which we identified as one of the core tenets of Western civilization and which has been coming up in most of the Greek and Roman texts. Jesus says, in the Sermon on the Mount, do not fret about your life. Worry not about what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall wear. Life means more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Does he not value you more than them? Which of you by worrying can add one day to your life? So then he says, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And so he says, look how God clothes the grass of the field alive today and cut down tomorrow. Will he not much more clothe you? Therefore, do not say in fear, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For your heavenly father knows your needs. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow can take care of itself. Now, the thing that jumps out at me about that is its relation to a statement we found in Aristotle last week, where Aristotle said, the rain does not fall so that the crops may grow, but of necessity. It seems to me that Jesus is saying the opposite. Jesus is saying, your father will take care of you. The rain does fall so that your crops may grow. And everything in nature, God is doing to provide for you. So this seems to me to be a break with the scientific aspect of Greek culture, going all the way back to Aristotle, and a kind of return to the idea of the universe as 
being animated by the will of gods, a much earlier kind of Homeric idea, perhaps. Judging others, this idea of purity again, why do you see the speck of dust in your brother's eye, but not the board in your own? First take care of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's. So one of the things Jesus really doesn't like is where people run around accusing others, pointing out their faults, criticizing others, and they don't criticize themselves, they don't examine themselves, they don't accept what Socrates said about examining their own lives. Basically, they're hypocrites. Now, we all know people, and actually teenagers are really good at this, pointing out that their parents are criticizing them for things that their parents do. And that, in fact, that's maybe one of the most frustrating things about being a teenager, is you feel you're being held to a standard, and then your parents aren't holding themselves to the same standard. So this is the thing that really bothers Jesus also. Um, if I okay, may move on in the text, I want to point out, as we finish out the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, don't throw pearls before swine. Has anyone heard that expression before? So, so let's say that you had a really great song and you wanted to go and play it. And you were going to premiere this song and your concert you had. You would wrote it and you thought it was the best song you'd ever wrote. And you're really going to knock it out of the park. But then what, and during the concert, the audience seemed kind of restless. Some people were booing. Some people were leaving. And then you turn to your bandmate and say, you know, should we play our new song for them? And your bandmate says, no way. Let, don't throw pearls before swine. So, you know, don't share your precious things with people who don't deserve them. Don't share the best parts of yourself with people that are not going to appreciate it. So now let's go on to this very important idea, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that is known as what? the golden rule, because you could wish that everyone would act that way. And when we get to the second semester, we get to Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, he calls it the categorical imperative. It's the one thing that you could wish that everyone would wish. So it's the one universal thing is that you could wish that everyone would treat everyone else as they wanted to be treated with that kind of goodwill. That's why it's called really the golden rule because it's, it's considered to apply to everyone. And it's considered the kind of perfect moral statement and no one's really been able to top it. And I think part of the reason for the appeal of Christianity is that one sentence, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And because that's very easy for people to think about, very easy, maybe it's not easy to live, but it's very easy to try to follow. It's a very simple rule and it's one that makes a lot of sense, and it's also a morality which applies to everyone. Below that, false prophets. Again, this Stoic idea of a tree bearing fruit and virtue being like the fruit of a tree. Jesus says, beware of false prophets who come to you like wolves in sheep's clothing, an expression you may have heard. How shall you tell the true prophets from the false? By their fruits you shall know them. Do grapes grow from thorns or figs from thistles? Every tree that does not bear good fruit will get cut down and thrown into the fire. We're starting to get with that idea of fire and punishment, a little bit of the Christian idea of punishment for sin, a little bit of the fear of God, and a little bit of the fear of hell, which comes into Christianity from its Roman nature and from places like Virgil's Underworld where a lot of the idea of a torture after death or the wicked people being tortured after death comes into Christianity from that idea of the underworld, because it's really not in the Jewish Bible. One of the things I would like to look at is Jesus' attitude toward the nuclear family, toward the family of your brother and your sister and your mother. Now, Jesus obviously was close with his own family and his own mother and father, but he then left them to go out on his own mission. And he didn't let his family ties get in the way of his divine mission. And he actually doesn't want other people's families to get in the way of their being holy and good. And so he, he basically says, when your family gets in the way of you being morally perfected, you should break with your family. 
And this is something that's unusual about Christianity and kind of new with Christianity. The idea, Jesus says, who is my real family? It's the people who follow me much more than my actual family. And there's a case where one of the disciples says to Jesus, I can't go with you right now. I have to go and bury my father who just died. And Jesus said to the disciple, follow me and leave the dead to bury the dead. So in other words, what I'm doing as the son of God on earth is more important than what you would be doing with your family. And I think that's something which some people found sort of hard to accept about Christianity. Jesus actually says, I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Those in a man's own household will become his foes. He does not deserve me who loves his parents or children more than me or who does not take his cross and follow me. He who finds his life will lose it and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So there's a certain irony there. You kind of have to die to your old world, your old self and your old values and be reborn in Christ, which is why Christians become baptized. This idea that you have to kind of leave your old world behind and create a new life under Christ. Just the last thing I would point out for tonight is how much Jesus reminds me of our old friend Diogenes. Now, obviously, Jesus has a lot more class in a certain sense and good manners than Diogenes. He's not going to do a lot of the things that Diogenes did. But in what ways does he perhaps remind you of Diogenes a little bit? He didn't have a lot of possessions. There's a place in here where Jesus says, go out, preach as you go, heal the sick and so forth. But he says, take no gold nor silver nor copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff. Whatever town or village you enter, find a worthy person and stay with him until you depart. You don't own anything. Just go and kind of trust to people's goodwill and live very, very simply. Now, this also is part of the Stoic idea. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, who was emperor, used to practice sleeping on the floor without a mattress or a pillow, just to kind of get used to the idea of not needing anything. Even though he was Roman emperor, he said, I still am going to prove to myself that I can sleep on the floor without a mattress or a pillow. So this idea of a kind of Spartan existence, a more stripped down experience, and not being enthralled to possessions is a really Christian idea. And we're going to see that when we talk about monasticism and the monks who kind of decide to live in the world, but not of the world. Let me just make one more point. Plucking grain on the Sabbath. And here Jesus starts to get into it with the rabbis. And this leads us to the way in which he's like Socrates, because he's taking on the moral establishment of his time, and he's going to get killed for it. And that's what we're going to talk about next time is the persecution and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. But here, here's where it starts happening. And this is what sets it up. He comes into conflict with the rabbis. You know, rabbi just means teacher, right? But these are holy um, men who have been studying the Torah their whole lives. Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples grew hungry and they plucked heads of grain to eat. When the rabbis saw this, they said to Jesus, look, your disciples break the laws of Moses, for they work on the Sabbath. Now, as you may know, in Orthodox Judaism, you're not allowed to do any work on the Sabbath. And if you're Orthodox today, you're like one of the black cats who live in Brooklyn, you're not allowed to press an elevator button on a Saturday, right? You're not allowed to light a stove on a Saturday. So if you're going to cook, you have to light your stove on Friday before sundown, and then you can kind of get around the law that way. So... Jesus said in response to the rabbi's criticism, have you not read what David did when he got hungry? He entered the temple and ate the bread that belonged to the priests. My father wishes mercy and not sacrifice. So there's this idea that Jesus is going to kind of start breaking some of the rabbinical laws. He's going to start breaking some of the Jewish laws because he thinks they don't serve their purpose. And he thinks that, that God didn't really mean for people to be so bound up in what we would call the letter of the law and forget about the spirit of the law. And so this is how Jesus starts getting into trouble with the rabbis because he starts challenging them and he claims some authority from God, his father, 
um, to challenge the rabbis on this. So with that, we will uh, adjourn and return again tomorrow night.